The depiction of a shattered mirror is one that director Tetsuya Takahashi has used a number of times to characterize one of Xenogears' central themes. In addition to the quote featured on screen, the script book for the game is titled Thousands of Daggers, and the song used in the ending credits contains the same symbolism in both its name and content. Even the battle screen transition exhibits the same imagery. But what I find most interesting is that the time that I spent playing the game in many ways also felt like a fractured experience. Despite its lapses though, Xenogears is one of the most poignant and impactful narrative works I've ever encountered and tells a story so expansive that it's inspired discussion, research, and introspection beyond what I ever anticipated. Xenogears is the invention of Tetsuya Takahashi and his wife, Kaori Tanaka, better known by her pen name, Soria Saga. Both were Square employees who had extensive experience working on Final Fantasy, but after the release of Final Fantasy VI, Takahashi began to feel a little frustrated with the direction the series was taking and restless to try bringing his own storytelling ambitions to light. Hironobu Sakaguchi recalled his own feelings about this in an interview with Satoru Iwata, where he said, They often ask me, is Final Fantasy all this company can let me create? I used to worry about that. One really clear memory I have is that no sooner had Takachan formed a separate team than his desk became completely covered in Gundam models and toy guns. It was then I realized he'd always wanted to work on this kind of thing. It's clear that Sakaguchi respected Takahashi immensely and considered him one of the most talented designers on his Final Fantasy team. He could sense Takahashi's growing desire to create his own game though, and so he advocated for him to have that opportunity. Originally, Xenogears began as a script proposal for Square executives to consider as they searched for ideas for Final Fantasy VII. In an interview with Siliconera, Soria Saga elaborates that while we were told it was too dark and complicated for a fantasy, the boss was kind enough to give Takahashi a chance to launch a new project. Then Takahashi and I wrote up a full screenplay which contained cutscene dialogues in final form, and thus the project was born. It's interesting to note that many of the reasons Square executives stated for rejecting Takahashi's proposal, including its dark, complicated story and science fiction elements, were eventually embraced for Final Fantasy VII, and there are several similarities that, while altered for the final game, still very much resemble the original pitch. Once Takahashi had received approval, however, development was by no means smooth sailing. In the same interview with Satoru Iwata previously referenced, Takahashi states that 90% of my team were actually new kids who didn't know the first thing about 3D. The most difficult thing was the psychological side, helping people adjust to the team, talking through their worries and concerns with them, and so on. It was then that I realized that Sakaguchi-san had been dealing with this kind of thing all along. In another interview, he recounts that with Xenogears, in the very beginning we started from the point of making a sequel to Chrono Trigger, but as various arguments from the publisher piled up, some practical difficulties came up. Thanks to Sakaguchi-san's great efforts on our behalf, we were allowed to make an original title. As the team was given the green light to move forward on an entirely new IP, codenamed Project Noah, Final Fantasy VII was already in production alongside it, and the budgetary difference became immediately apparent to Takahashi. I can imagine how frustrating it would have been for him, attempting to create something so visionary and ambitious with what I think we can safely assume was a much smaller allocation of funds. With an inexperienced team, limited capital, and an idea that was likely too expansive for its own good, it's no surprise that the team had a number of setbacks, which unfortunately is apparent in the final product. In addition to pacing issues and a very rushed presentation on disc 2, the visuals also had to be altered from Takahashi's original vision. At the outset, he wanted to make the entire game in full 3D, but due to limitations of the hardware for a game of this size, ultimately decided to make the environments in 3D while representing the characters with 2D sprites. In the end, I feel this was a blessing in disguise because I actually appreciate the look of Xenogears quite a bit more than Final Fantasy VII, which basically took the exact opposite approach. I honestly think that Xenogears visuals are the perfect answer for the PS1 hardware when it comes to large-scale RPGs like this, and while Final Fantasy VIII and IX made incredibly effective improvements on the visual style of VII, there's just something about the hybrid design of Grandia and Xenogears that I find especially charming. I also found the cinematic techniques employed here, like camera movement and composition of specific shots, to be notably impressive. I think it's clear that not only the content of the story, which is excellent in and of itself, 
but also the method of delivery of that story was critical to Takahashi, which is why I feel that the second disc feels so clumsy in comparison to the first. There are dozens of rumors that have attempted to explain the discrepancy, and sifting through what has been confirmed by developers and what is simply hearsay can be difficult. But one thing is certain, as deadlines began to draw near, the team felt a great deal of pressure. God, that was hell, described Yasuyuki Hone. I can tell you I'm not going to go through it again. How we ever finished it is still a mystery to me. It was tough, and only a total nut would go through it, added chief art designer Ko Arai. Then, of course, we have Takahashi's own words. Frankly, I remember not having a very good feeling at the beginning of development. We were squeezed between two big titles that Square were promoting heavily. In that situation, if we had had an owner who showed the proper sensitivity, we might not have fallen into the mental state where we were liable to get everything from stomach ulcers and twisted intestines to hernias and spot baldness. All that said, considering how it all ended up, while I honestly thought I might go bald, in the end I didn't lose any hair and my health wasn't ruined. With all of this in mind, it's understandable, but I certainly wouldn't say excusable that the game ended up as such an uneven production. While having little support and unreasonable scheduling expectations from the company certainly limited what they could accomplish, it's first and foremost the responsibility of the director to manage the scale of a production in accordance with the time and resources available. In this case, there's evidence to suggest that not only was the game an enormous undertaking from the very beginning, but that Takahashi continued to expand the story as the game was being developed, and persisted even after it was released. In my opinion, it was Takahashi's ambition and mismanagement, in addition, of course, to Square's lack of support, that led to many of Xenogear's largest issues. If you're going to give this game a try, it's important to understand just how drastically it changes between Disc 1 and Disc 2. While Disc 1 plays as you might expect from a JRPG of this era, with world map exploration, towns and shops filled with NPCs, hidden treasure, and random enemy encounters, Disc 2 is almost entirely narrated by the characters, to the extent that in a couple of instances, the path through a dungeon is explained exclusively through text, with the player being dropped into a boss fight at the end. This is certain to turn some players off, which is understandable, but keep in mind that despite this strange shift in direction and total hijack of player control, I still genuinely and wholeheartedly recommend that you play this game. There are several reasons why I say this. The battle system is really cool, the art and visual presentation are outstanding, but the story and symbolism are what really set it apart. I'm not going to talk about any of the details of the story here, I'll save that analysis for a separate video. But understanding the numerous sources of inspiration for Xenogears can go a long way toward helping decipher a layered and labyrinthine plot that can easily confuse players on their first run of the game. As mentioned previously, Xenogears was a passion project for Tetsuya Takahashi and his wife, who wrote the story together. They had several shared interests, most notably an enthusiasm for psychology and particularly psychoanalysis. Freudian and Neo-Freudian influences are instantly recognizable, and several philosophical ideas from the greatest thinkers of the last 200 years, people like Friedrich Nietzsche, Karen Horney, Carl Jung, and Jacques Lacan, are often referenced and brilliantly woven into the fiction in such a way that not only leaves a profound impact, but also feels believable. Being even lightly familiar with these people and the theories that they explored in their collective works will go a long way towards understanding what Xenogears is trying to present with its story. I'll share one example that I found to be particularly effective. Karen Horney's theory of neurosis differed from what her contemporaries believed, except in cases involving the effects that parents' actions have on their children. She heavily emphasized that it was the child's perception of his or her parents' actions, more than what those actions really were, that were fundamental in shaping or shattering a child's psyche. This concept is perfectly explored with Xenogear's main character and his parents, but most specifically with his mother, Karen. And yes, that name is certainly not a coincidence in this case. It's clear that Karen from Xenogears was named after Karen Horney and explicitly embodies her ideas about neurosis. This is one example of many that demonstrates how Takahashi and Soria were able to implement subtle but powerful layers of depth into the storytelling of this game. And even if the underlying concepts are not understood, the impact of those ideas can be felt through the violent and tragic nature of its delivery. It cannot be understated that the thematic content of Xenogears is heavy, 
It was inspired a great deal by the works of Arthur C. Clarke, especially Childhood's End, as well as other science fiction stories like Soylent Green. There are strong messages that criticize systematic racism and class warfare, the abuse of children by parents, and even some that question established religion and the blind faith of followers. The last is what I'd like to focus on now because there are some people who believe that Xenogears carries some kind of contemporary anti-religious message, which I simply don't agree with. It's important to understand that the religious content of Xenogears is inspired by Gnosticism and the religions that branched off of that school of thought, rather than traditional Christianity. The concept of the Demiurge, or a lesser and in many cases a malicious or evil godlike figure who fashioned the material world but is not the creator in the monotheistic sense, is what is referenced as God throughout the game. So when the characters talk about God, what they're actually talking about is a demiurge, rather than a Christian-inspired creator figure. The potential confusion was actually a great sense of anxiety for Richard Honeywood, who was the sole translator for the project for a large majority of its development. It was because of the possible controversial backlash to these religious concepts in Western countries that all the other translators initially interested in the project quickly walked away. And so the work of translating one of the longest and most difficult scripts to come from Square at that time fell on one man, making some of the late game concepts more difficult to understand, as well as delivering dialogue that can sometimes feel silly. This wasn't necessarily uncommon for Western localized projects at the time, and certainly isn't any worse than other Square games. But because the script is so massive, I found myself noticing it a little more than I remember in other titles. This is by no means a game-breaking problem, and considering it was all done by one person, I actually think Honeywood performed a small miracle that deserves praise. For the most part, the script feels intelligently written and appropriately composed for the tone the game is going for, which is what matters most to me. And in service to that tone, the music and sound design are also expertly crafted. One of my favorite aspects of the game is actually how punchy the sound design is, which makes the deathblow attacks feel immensely satisfying. The music, though, is what some players I've spoken with consider to be the game's most impressive feature. While I agree it's wonderful, I must admit that I still think there's one glaring problem with the soundtrack. There just isn't enough music here for such a long game. For a comparison, the average playtime to complete Final Fantasy VII's story is just under 40 hours, and the soundtrack for that game contains 85 tracks. Xenogears, on the other hand, takes 56 hours to complete the main story, yet only has 44 tracks. This means that a game with a story that is roughly 25-30% to 30 longer has half the number of songs to draw from, which unfortunately leads to a lot of repetition, something I found both fatiguing and sometimes immersion-breaking. There are one or two instances where the reuse of a song is not only tiresome, but also just completely wrong for the context of the scene in my opinion. The footage you're seeing now of an enemy gear transformation during a pivotal boss fight is strangely accented by a hopeful, almost joyous, melody that had come earlier in the game during an important character moment. This is clearly not meant to be used as leitmotif, and is likely just a result of having no other music to draw from, but it's a great example of how quickly music can become associated with specific characters, themes, and moments of a story, and how misusing that theme later can do a lot to hurt the delivery of important narrative beats. This is of course no fault of the composers, but rather the event planners and the director, that getting back to my criticism of how the game as a whole was mismanaged. Yasunori Mitsuda did a remarkable job with the time he was given, and even to the admission of Takahashi, really made the cohesion of the game's various parts possible. During a time when he felt that the game simply wasn't coming together the way he'd envisioned, Takahashi saw that once Mitsuda's music was in place, everything began to move closer to what he had been conceptualizing. Yasunori is one of the people who heavily supported me in Xenogears. Without his music, the game would have been a lot worse than our goal. My determination wouldn't have continued either. This soundtrack holds everything that enhanced me and this project. To that end, I definitely agree. When the music is used right, which, to be fair, is a majority of the time, especially early on, it's absolutely magnificent. It unifies and brings the game's messages into clearer focus, delivering the emotional impact that is both crucial and appropriate for the subject matter. It's the kind of music that has a long-lasting effect, that will stay with you throughout the day and cause you to think about the game even when you aren't playing it. To put it simply, it's effective, so much so that despite the fact that it can become repetitive, I still think it's one of the best soundtracks Mitsuda has ever produced. 
If nothing else, it certainly has more weight and maturity than the Chrono Trigger soundtrack, even if I like that soundtrack a little more overall. This did not come without repercussions, however. Just as was the case with Chrono Trigger, Mitsuda worked at the cost of his health on Xenogears. The developing took time, as I predicted, and I had the most difficult time. I anticipated it, of course, because I was trying to go beyond what I had done. I often thought, ah, I can't do this anymore, followed by no, I can do this, I must, and advance little by little every day. Creating something out of nothing requires the most power. I haven't done anything but composing, but I think the same could be applied to anything. I often wonder, why am I doing such a painful thing? During his time at Square, this was simply the way that Mitsuda operated. After Chrono Trigger, he worked on Radical Dreamers, Front Mission Gun Hazard, and Tobol No. 1 before Xenogears, and on each one of these projects, he suffered significant health complications due to stress from overworking. While he told Square upon being hired that he considered this job a stepping stone to something greater, I'm sure that his desire to take better care of himself also played a part in why he decided to leave the company after finishing Xenogears. By the way, this should not be viewed as an expression of my love of music, because honestly I was making up for a lack of skill. In any case, I was clearly not allowing myself enough time between work to allow my body to recover. As a result, by the end of each project I was invariably rushed to the hospital. Having suffered through those experiences, I now place a higher priority on maintaining good health. In particular, I take care of what I eat, and though I was once a heavy smoker, I've since given up the habit. He returned in a freelance position to compose Chrono Cross for Square, but since then he's not worked with them on a single project. He did, however, work with Takahashi again on the first episode of Xenosaga. While Xenogears is clearly focused first on story, the gameplay mechanics are actually quite unique and overall fairly satisfying. In terms of exploration, the world is designed in full 3D, and the player is given the freedom to pivot the camera while looking for hidden paths and treasure. For the most part, this works beautifully, but there were a number of times when I felt like I couldn't get a very good look at where I was and what was around me due to large objects high above the ground that obstructed my view. There are also a lot of areas that can be confusing to navigate because everything in the environment looks so similar. Hallways and doors and more hallways that are essentially carbon copies of each other can make getting through certain dungeons really arduous. But from a design and a world building standpoint, these decisions actually make perfect sense. There are also some platforming elements that many players hate. I don't personally feel they're as bad as a lot of people make them out to be, but the controls certainly don't feel very tight, so I can understand why a lot of people struggle during these sections. The battle system is where the game certainly feels a bit more refined. The classic turn-based system of past RPGs from Square is accented with a button combo component that feels reminiscent of many 2D fighters from the early 90s, if not also a great deal simpler. In essence, while the command menu is basically the same as what you would expect from any other JRPG, the attack command doesn't just send the character into an automatic, generic melee animation. Rather, once selecting the attack command, the player then has a certain number of moves, represented by ability points, that can be performed depending on the character's level. At low levels, the character only gets three ability points per turn, which can be used by selecting either triangle, square, or X. Triangle is a weaker attack, but only uses one ability point, which in this example means it could be used three times per round. Square is slightly stronger, but has a lower chance of success and requires two ability points. X is the strongest attack of the three, but has the lowest hit percentage and requires three ability points. This seems simple enough at first, but it actually goes a lot deeper than that, and most of it isn't fully explained within the game itself. Basically, the way the system works is that each time you perform one of these attacks, the game is keeping track behind the scenes and accumulating a hidden form of experience that goes into unlocking death blows. Death blows are powerful, visceral attacks that require specific combo inputs, but before you can perform a death blow, you have to unlock it. Unlocking death blows requires gaining experience from inputting specific combinations of the triangle, square, and X commands. For example, there are actually four different animations for the triangle attack. Here's what they look like performed in sequence. I'll refer to each one of these four triangle attacks as T1, T2, T3, and T4. The square attack has two animations, which I'll refer to as S1 and S2. X only has one animation, so that's pretty easy. What this leaves us with are seven different experience pools, and each one of those needs to be focused on when unlocking death blows. Essentially, what you have to do is gain experience not only in T1, but also in T2, T3, and T4 to unlock certain death blows. 
You'll also need to gain experience in both S1 and S2 if you want to unlock others. So for instance, we'll take Faye's Kake Deathblow, which is executed by inputting triangle, square, triangle, and X. To unlock this Deathblow, you would need to obtain a set amount of experience in T1, S2, T3, and X. To unlock Suike, which is executed by inputting square, triangle, triangle, and X, you would need to accrue experience in S1, T2, T3, and X. None of this is explained in the game, which can lead to progress and learning new death blows feeling erratic or random. It's also important to understand that while you may have gathered all the experience you need to unlock your next death blow, there are still level requirements that will keep them sealed for low level characters. Once you understand how this works though, unlocking death blows becomes a lot less tedious, and it's always a satisfying feeling to finally put a new death blow you've unlocked to use, because these moves are freaking awesome. Another really cool thing you can do is cancel your turn when it comes up, which actually takes all the AP from that turn and stores it for your next turn. By canceling for multiple turns in a row, you can build up a great deal of AP, then decide to unleash it all in one round by stringing multiple death blows together, which can be very useful against enemies that automatically counter death blow attacks. It's seriously so satisfying to unleash a bunch of your most powerful attacks all at once for ridiculous damage, especially against some of the game's toughest bosses. In addition to this though, you have the gear battles, which function a little differently from the standard ones. In the gears, you have a fuel gauge, which is depleted as you use your triangle, square, and X commands, and death blows only become available as you unlock them on foot for each of your characters. On top of this, you have to build up your attack level in order to use the more powerful death blows in the gears. A lot of these smaller intricacies either aren't explained very well or simply aren't explained at all in the game, but with enough experimentation or a quick visit to game FAQs, it's not terribly difficult to understand and it's a lot of fun in practice. My favorite aspect of the battle system was the importance of equipment and accessories for the gears. There were certain fights where I got completely obliterated on my first attempt, but by paying attention to the types of attacks the boss used and equipping my gears accordingly, I found myself having a much easier time. There's also a lot of strategy in how the player chooses to upgrade the gears, with certain parts greatly increasing attack power but also providing a very low fuel gauge. Other parts greatly increase your fuel gauge but would only slightly increase attack power which puts the player in a position to choose whether they want to go all out and finish a boss quickly before running out of fuel, or playing more conservatively and taking their time. This ability to take several approaches to battle leaves room for experimentation and different strategies, which makes the more important battles rewarding. One could certainly argue that the standard battles aren't as stimulating and don't require the same level of strategy due to the fact that each death blow the player unlocks more or less makes the last one obsolete. But there are a few of them that have elemental damage attached which comes in handy against a small number of fights in the late game where elemental weaknesses can be exploited. Xenogears is an incredibly unique and deeply introspective game with lots of great ideas. But unfortunately, it didn't have the time or resources required to see those ideas come together in a complete, adhesive fashion. Much like the shattered mirror imagery that so perfectly characterizes the game's central message, the experience of playing also feels fractured. But while certain aspects of the game left me feeling frustrated, I can't overstate how satisfied I was overall despite those grievances. The delivery of the story, especially on disc 2, feels clumsy and rushed, but the content of that story is so fascinating that I found myself willing to forgive it. There are enough of the battle mechanics left unexplained that it can make things a little confusing, but the ideas behind those mechanics were interesting enough to keep me engaged. The design of certain areas feels so samey that it can become easy to get lost, but being able to swing the camera opens up a lot of possibilities for exploration, and like I mentioned earlier, often these design choices made sense from a narrative standpoint. I've heard several players positing the theory that due to the game's themes, these miscues might have been intentional, and that the feeling of incompleteness actually makes the game more powerful and endearing, more human even, than it would have been otherwise. I'll allow Tetsuya Takahashi to speak for himself on this. It's now six months since Xenogears was released. Looking back on it, there are things that appear rushed and, I must admit sheepishly, make me a little embarrassed. I find it hard to believe that he would feel sheepish or embarrassed like this if it was done intentionally. Additionally though, if the game had been given more time to deliver the story in a consistent way, 
Would its messages really have felt less impactful? Would a greater sense of completeness really diminish its humanity? I, for one, don't believe so, which is why I feel that this game, more than any other I've played, would benefit so much from being remade, this time being given the proper support and resources it deserves. However, whether a hypothetical remake is ever approached by Square, I must emphasize again that even in its original form, Xenogears is a wonderful game that I would recommend to anyone who is a fan of old school JRPGs. Despite all of its imperfections, it left a profound impression on me, and like I said earlier, inspired research and discussion on a level that surprised me. It's layered and complex in its philosophical content, keen and effective in its emotional power, and ultimately fun to play a majority of the time. It has an endearing cast of characters, unforgettable set pieces and scenarios, and some genuinely effective twists. It's an experience that once it sets its hooks in you is difficult to walk away from, and it's one that I'll not easily forget. Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you appreciate what we're doing here and you'd like to help support and grow the channel, please feel free to check out our Patreon page. There's an icon just below me that you can click on and it'll take you directly there. And if you're new to the channel and you'd like to see some of the other work I've done, I have my Final Fantasy reviews right here. Just go ahead and click on that card. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.